Hi, my name is Martin Smithson and I'm an architect on the WebSphere Service Registry and Repository product. And I'm going to demonstrate how you can register an existing service in WSRR and then proxy that service using a message flow running in IBM Integration Bus. The service that we're going to use is a, a simple math service that performs basic mathematical operations like add, subtract, etc. We're going to drive that using a simple swing based application that enables you to specify some arguments and an operation to perform. You click the equals button and it sends it off to the server, gets the results back and then displays the results on screen. So in order to register the service inside WSRR we're going to use the service registry dashboard. This is the web front end onto WSRR and it provides uh, each user with a tailored view onto the data depending on the user role they're in. So I'm currently logged in as a super user so I have access to all the views that are, that are currently defined within the product. Um, and I can switch between them quite easily using the view menu at the top here. I'm currently looking at the, the SOA governance view, which is a view tailored towards those users who are responsible for uh, governing the overall process of the service development lifecycle, so authorizing the development of new services and ensuring the services that are developed uh, sort of comply with the, the standards that they've decided that they want to use for service development within their organization. Now, if we were proposing a new service, you'd typically have a, a business analyst come in and search the, the services that are already registered in WSRR, looking for a service that does the things that they need. Uh, once they'd satisfied themselves that there are no services out there that, that meet their needs, they would create a new business service and attach some requirements in, in a requirements document to that service and then propose the service so that it can go off to the SOA governance guys uh, who can then review it and decide whether or not they want to approve the development of that service. However, since we're registering an existing service, uh, we're just going to do that within the SOA governance space here. So the first step in that process is to create a business service. So this is a, a business view onto the, the service. Um, so we provide it with a name. We can give it a description. And as I mentioned before, we can load a, a requirements document, associate a requirements document with this service that describes the overall requirements of the of the service itself. Uh, we can give that requirements document a, a, a version number if we want to, um, and that can get loaded into WSRR. So when we're happy that we've provided all the information that we need for the business service, uh, we can click finish, and that will go off and create the business service in WSRR. Um, and we're navigated off to the, the Browse tab uh, where we can see the details of the business service that we've just created. Now, because WSRR is a, a governance registry, uh, the various things that you, that you register inside WSRR go through a life cycle. And a business service is no exception to that. Um, as we mentioned before, typically a, a business analyst is, is coming in and performing these steps. Um, and at this stage, he would normally uh, propose the, the service so that it can go off to the SOA governance guys and they can review it. So they would propose it by selecting Propose Charter and we can see that the, the governance state has changed to Charter Review. A SOA governance user would then typically come in and review the requirements for the service uh, by clicking on the link uh, and the requirements document will be opened in, in a suitable editor. Um, they can read over the requirements and satisfy themselves that they're happy with the requirements of the service as it's currently proposed. They could then uh, attempt to approve the service, uh, but one of the powerful things that WSR enables you to do is to protect the transitions that occur as an object's moving through its life cycle to ensure that all the right information is being provided before the transition is allowed to incur. And this is achieved using something called governance policies. Now, out of the box, there's a, a governance policy defined that protects the approved charter transition um, that tries to ensure that an owning organization has been assigned to the business service before it can be approved. So I've just tried to do that and here you can see the the error that I get. An owning organization must be associated with the business capability. Um, so in order to do that I can come in and add the owning organization. Uh, here I'm just going to add the, the common services organization. Um, once that's done I can click finish. I now see that the owning organization is, is associated with this business service and at this point when I click approve charter we can see that the governance policy now passes and that the operation is successful. So now my business service is moved into the, the approved state.
Now I've also configured WSRR to automatically create the initial version of a service once my business services get to the approved state. So here we can see that the math service version 1.0 appeared once I'd moved into the approved state. And this is my initial representation of, of an implementation of the service. And this is the thing that I'm going to associate the, the service artifacts with. So in order to do that, I just come in and I edit the actual the math service itself version 1.0.0 uh, and I want to come in and add my uh, service definition documents on the artifacts relationship so once I click add document there I can click load and go off to the file system uh, and load the definition of the service so here uh, I, the math service itself is actually defined using a split WSDL approach so I, I'm going to point it at the endpoint WSDL uh, and give that a version um, when I click next, the document itself is actually pushed up to WSRR and WSRR looks inside the document and sees that the, the, the WSDL actually imports another WSDL, in this case the binding WSDL. Um, and in order to ensure I've got a complete definition of the service, WSRR is telling me I need to, to also provide the binding WSDL as well. So I can click add, I can go and find the binding WSDL, um, give that a version as well. And when I click OK, that document is pushed up to WSRR and it now looks inside that and tells me that I actually need the interface WSDL as well. So I go through that process once more and at this point when I click OK WSRR is now happy that I've got a full definition, a full representation of the service uh, and I can now click finish if I want to. Now I could have achieved the same thing by packaging up these WSDLs together in a zip file and loading uh, the single zip file into WSRR but I thought it was important to walk you through the load document uh, wizard process and show you how WSRR uh, can analyze the documents that you're trying to load and show you that you need additional information before you can complete the loading process. So now that I have all the documents there, I can click finish to complete the loading process uh, and they're loaded into WSRR and we can see that uh, my artifacts relationship now points to the, the, the root devil WSDL that I originally loaded. One other thing that I want to be able to do is to uh, enter the email address of the owner of the service. This is so that uh, if potential consumers of this service log on to WSRR, they'll be able to send the, uh, the owner an email uh, in order to request consumption of the service. So now I have captured all of the information that I need, I can click finish. And then I can start moving this service version through its, its governance process. So typically the first thing you would do is to propose the scope of the service. And then someone in the SOA governance organization would review the service and would then come along and approve the scope. Now the life cycles in WSRR are completely customizable. So the registration process can have as few or as many steps uh, as you'd like in your, in your service development life cycle. But I've now provided enough information as part of the initial registration to allow me to start consuming the metadata in WSA from within the IOB message flow. So the last thing I want to do uh, before I head off and start developing the message flow in IOB is to ensure that the, the service level definition has the right endpoint associated with it. So the service level definition in WSRR is used to represent the, the non-functional requirements or the qualities of service you can expect to get from uh, a given service on that endpoint. Uh, so what I need to do is come in and associate the endpoint for the math service uh, with the service level definition. So here's the endpoint. I have a click finish and update it. So here we can see in the service level definition, here's my endpoint associated with the service level definition. You'll also notice that the endpoint is showing as, as being offline. So we need to fix that. So we can go into the endpoint itself. Um, but before we can approve it for use, we actually need to associate uh, an environment with it. Um, so if we edit the metadata for it um, and we add an environment, I think we'll say that the, the endpoint is a development endpoint. Uh, click finish. So here's the environment now associated with that endpoint. Uh, and then we can improve the, the endpoint for use. So now we can see that the, the governance state has changed to online. And we now have enough information in, in WSRR uh, about the math service so that we can start uh, interacting with WSRR from inside uh, IIB message flow in order to proxy requests to that backend service. The first thing that we want to do uh, when implementing the message flow that's proxying this backend service is to actually get the, the service definition documents into the integration toolkit workspace. Now one way we could do this is to uh, 
get the documents from the, the service registry dashboard using the download service definition documents link here uh, off, of the, off of the endpoint in this case. Um, that gets WSR to package those documents up into a, a zip file which we could then use to import into the, the workspace. But a better way to do this is actually to make use of the WSR Eclipse plugin that you can install into existing Eclipse environments and then use it to pull documents from WSR directly into your, your workspaces. Once you've done that, you get the, the wizard content view that we can see down here. And in order to pull documents in, I just need to configure a, a WSR location, which I've already done. Um, this is the, the server that, that we've just registered our math service in. Uh, and I can just click retrieve wizard documents. Now, this pulls in sort of all the documents that are currently uh, in the WSR instance that I'm, I'm pointing at. So I might actually want to uh, filter that down. So it's possible to just do a, a smaller retrieve where I can specify a filter. So here, any wisdom documents that start with the name math. Uh, and we can see that that's pulled in all three documents uh, that define or provide the service definition. Now these documents haven't actually been brought into the workspace yet. In order to do that, I'll need to sort of right click on one and say I want to import a document. Uh, I need to specify the, the target uh, location where I want to put them. Uh, I'll also need to say I want to include all the dependent artifacts and entities because remember that, that the math service is defined using the split WSDL approach. So uh, I'll need to pull in not just the endpoint WSDL but the binding and the interface WSDL as well. So I'll select the Include All Dependent Artifacts checkbox uh, and click Finish. So you can see that the WSDL documents that have been pulled in have some errors. And this is because IBM Integration Bus doesn't handle uh, WSDL documents that define inline schemas. So in order to get around this problem, uh, we need to define a, a message model for this. So we go New Message Model. Um, and we're going to generate a message model from the WSDL itself. So it's SOAP XML. Uh, we already have a WSDL for the data. Um, we specify the WSDL that we want to generate the message model from uh, and then we click finish. And so this has pulled out the inline schema into a separate XSD and updated the math service uh, interface to uh, pull in that schema instead. And with the errors removed, we're now ready to actually create the message flow itself. So if we right click on the application, say that we want a new message flow, we'll call it uh, math service proxy and this creates the message flow and opens it up in the in the message flow editor. And we can now start adding nodes to the flow. So we'll start off with a, a SOAP input node. Uh, on the properties for this, we need to specify um, the WSDL that this is going to sort of take requests for. Um, so we're going to specify the WSDL interface and then select the WSDL file. Uh, in our case, it's going to be uh, the endpoint WSDL for our service. Once we've selected that, a number of the other properties uh, on this node are sort of updated to reflect the contents of the WSDL itself. We'll also need to know the sort of the URL that we're going to hit when we invoke this. And again, it's taken its information from uh, the, the actual WSDL files that we pointed it at. So when we finally come to use our calculator application to invoke the, the proxy flow, uh, it's going to have uh, this uh, sort of path to it on the on the URL. The next node that we want to add to our flow is the uh, actual endpoint lookup node. So this node is going to uh, actually query registry based off the properties that are configured on the node. So the first thing we need to do is specify the port type name, uh, the namespace, and the version of the object that we want to retrieve. Now we also want to specify a classification uh, to say that we only want to retrieve uh, endpoints from WSRR that are classified as being online. So recall that when we registered the service, we actually went in and classified the endpoint as being online. Uh, and that's important now as part of developing the message flow. So we actually need to specify the full AL URI of the online classification in order for the query to work properly. Now we're going to wire the out terminal of the input node onto the in terminal for our endpoint lookup node. Now the other th important thing to point out here is that we've got a match policy on this node of, of one. So that enables us to wire it directly to a, a SOAP request node uh, because if it finds an endpoint, it'll put it into the local environment in the right place so that the SOAP request node can use that endpoint directly. So we're just gonna wire 
the out node of our endpoint lookup node into the, the in node of the, of the SOAP request node. And then finally, we obviously want to return a, a reply uh, to the caller. So we're going to wire the out, uh, output node of the SOAP request node to the input node of the SOAP reply node. And we're pretty much ready to go. But one important thing that we do want to do is to make sure that we return a, a nice error if the endpoint lookup node is unable to find any endpoints in WSRR at all. So what we're going to do now is add in a, a Java compute node that we are going to use to programmatically generate a SOAP fault in situations where um, we don't find any results from WSRR. So here we're wiring the no match node to the input node of that Java compute node. And then I'm going to actually add the, the Java code in that will programmatically generate the SOAP fault. So first I need to specify a Java file to hold that. Uh, we're just going to accept the defaults here. Um, we actually want to create a message class. We, we need the, the copy headers method that's going to get generated as part of that. Um, so when I click finish, I get a sort of uh, boilerplated piece of Java code that will do a bunch of the work for me. I'm actually going to replace this with some code I have from a, a cheat sheet. Um, it's not very complicated. It's basically creating the structure of a SOAP fault and setting that into a, a new output message. Um, but this will guarantee that, that I get a SOAP fault uh, in situations where there are, are no results returned from WSRR. So once I've done that, I then need to wire the output terminal from the Java compute node into the input terminal for the SOAP reply. Uh, and I'm now good to go. So if I save my flow, I can then go on and deploy it. Actually, one thing I've forgotten is uh, I need to go in and specify that the SOAP request needs to work as a as a generic web service to allow me to forward it on forward on any requests for the add, subtract, multiply, divide. Uh, I also need to put in a URL, uh, even though we're going to have that sort of overridden anyway. So I guess just to prove that we're we're taking the endpoint from the WSR lookup, I'm going to set uh, just a dummy endpoint on there that doesn't resolve down to anything at all. Now if I connect into my remote broker, I can actually come in and deploy my flow. Um, so here I'm just going to specify deploy down onto my sort of default execution group uh, and click finish to push it out to my, my remote instance of integration bus. And now we should be able to see it running down here on the remote integration bus instance. So the next thing we need to do is to actually test the flow using the calculator application. So if we switch over to the calculator application uh, and I put in a host name of Dagger, specify the right port uh, for the, the port that the integration bus is listening on, and I've got my uh, path correct. If I click equals, I can see that I'm now invoking the calculator application via the message uh, flow proxy that I've just implemented and deployed. And in order to prove that it's actually using the metadata from WSRR, I can flip back to the, the service registry dashboard and I can actually take the endpoint uh, from its online state to an offline state and show that the, the message flow proxy will no longer invoke it. So if I revoke the endpoint from use, I can see it's now in the offline state. Um, and I can switch back to the calculator application. And now when I attempt to invoke it, I'll get an error. Uh, and remember, this is because the endpoint lookup node in the flow is querying for endpoints from WSRR that are in the online state. So if I flip it back into the online state uh, and go back to my calculator application, uh, it starts working fine. And that completes the demo. Um, hopefully you've seen that it's a pretty easy task to register a, an existing service in WSRR uh, and also to create uh, message flows in IIB that can proxy the services that are registered in WSRR. Thank you very much.